The village of Islip near Oxford has got a claim to fame. It's said that the great Saxon king Edward the Confessor was born somewhere round here. And the local villagers want to celebrate the millennium anniversary of his birth. So they've asked us whether we can find the 13th century chapel that was built in his honour. Not only that, but they want us to find the Saxon palace where he was born, which seems to me a pretty tall order. Except the fact is, nobody has ever dug here before, and we've got just three days to try and sort it all out. The village of Islip is about six miles northeast of Oxford, and these days it's home to some 600 people who'd love to find some actual evidence in the ground to prove their link with Edward the Confessor. I don't know about you, but I always get really confused by all the English Saxon kings and their elaborate names, so I'm very pleased to see this bloke, Sam. Morning, Tony. What are the dates of Edward the Confessor? 1042 to January the 5th, 1066. And what's he famous for? He's famous for keeping the country safe for a generation and for the great building project at Westminster Abbey. But on the downside, big succession crisis because no children. So then you get King Harold, Harold's yeah. arrow through the eye, and William the Conqueror. That's right, and Battle of Hastings. Why is he called the Confessor? Uh, it's a name given to him long after his death, once he became regarded as a saint. A confessor is like a priest, a monk. This is very quick history, this, isn't it? So, to begin with, we're going to have a go at finding this medieval stone chapel built in honour of Edward the Confessor. And this illustration by antiquarian Thomas Hearn is the only clue we have to what it actually looked like. Helpfully, Hearn tells us that it was situated to the north of the church, which probably means that it's now buried under one of these gardens. But the villagers reckon it's going to be easy to work out where it was. Stuart, on the face of it, this looks extremely simple because I've just spotted sight of King's Chapel <laughs> and a big cross. So, <laughs> what's the problem? It does look pretty obvious, doesn't it? <laughs> now, the problem with these crosses, when the map makers were coming round in, in the late 18th century, they, they were soldiers. Mm -hmm. They'd speak to the local vicar or local antiquarian, and he might have said, ah, there was a palace over there, or there was a moat over there, or there was a, a chapel over there. And it wasn't that important to it, them. No, it wasn't. So... so that could be one of two things. It could be somebody precisely knew where that was, and that is bang on. Mm -hmm. Or alternatively, it could be just, oh, it was, it was over in that yard somewhere, and the surveyor just put the cross there. Tricky. Stuart's worked out where the cross would be on the modern map. And it falls firmly Ooh. in the middle of that timber yard. Well, this is a surprise. No resistance from Geofiz. Let's hope it's all worth it, because, of course, we can't trust the big X on the map. It's quite possible that the remains of the chapel could be in the pub car park. Or in the garden of the house next door. There's no room for Geofiz to survey in this garden, so we've decided to open up a few random test pits. Speed things up. But there's still a very good reason for digging here in the Garden of Confessor's Gate, and that is the house deeds include a plan that marks the site of the King's Chapel. That yeah. little square there is where the map maker shows us the chapel. It's yeah. tiny. Yeah. And it's the wrong direction. It, well, it, but on the other hand, if that's the if that's the east end of it, yeah, it would be over there somewhere where the blue sheet is. It would, mean it would be coming back this way. I'd be incredibly happy, wouldn't it, if that, that would, were that right? Be better, wouldn't it? And it extends underneath our feet with something. something up to that sort of size. Yeah. So we're going to extend one of our test pits in this garden to cover that possibility, even if one of the oh, residents has other ideas. <laughs> Damn thing! Hey, <laughs> <laughs> Got it. <laughs> so, with a trench in this garden and one in the timber yard, which has just got going again, we've got two possible sites for our chapel. History doesn't get any bigger than this, and I'm still hopeful we might stumble on the Saxon palace where Edward was born. Edward's failure to produce an heir may have resulted in the Battle of Hastings in 1066 but he was also responsible for the building of Westminster Abbey. As I understand it, Edward left the manor of Islip to the monastery before he died. Westminster then built the chapel in Islip in honour of Edward some years later. The chapel was built more than 150 years after Edward's death, which would put it in the reign of Henry III. This would make sense, as Henry was obsessed with the memory of Edward the Confessor, who'd been made a saint in 1161. Henry rebuilt Edward's Abbey at Westminster, 
and may have been responsible for building the chapel in Islip. He was keen to popularise the figure of Saint Edward and encouraged the cult following for him that was growing in the 13th century. The cult of Saint Edward is one that has been growing through the reigns of previous kings, flowers, really flowers, in Henry III's time. And what, we, what, what it seems to represent is a way of those Norman and Plantagenet kings giving legitimacy to their rule over the English, at the same time as, uh, for the English themselves, Edward being the last of the legitimate old English kings, it thus represents a kind of reconciliation focus for the French and the English. So it's as though the Normans are saying, it's all right, Saxons, because uh, we're related to Edward the Confessor, who you like. Exactly, exactly. It was your born in uh, the little dwelling in which I was born, be naman yit slepper by the name of Islip. There, there's no point in making that up, really, it, especially because people in the early 12th century might have known that he, he, if he'd been born somewhere else, they might have known that. As if we could ever have doubted it, Edward was born in Islip. And believe it or not, just now in the Garden of Confessor's Gate, we've made a remarkable discovery celebrating that very fact. Now, a bit of glass. isn't this <laughs> just what Every archaeologist in the world wow. would like to see if they're digging a historical <laughs> character. Fesser. Fantastic. What do you think that is? I see. It looks like it's early Victorian or some, something of that period, early 19th century. Geophys are only too pleased to escape the problems of small back gardens and they've already surveyed a small area of this open field. And the first trench will go in here. Believe the geophysics. <laughs> you, you didn't tell me that it was specifically a war. You said there was a large anomaly there. But what we have here is a chance to investigate a forgotten medieval manor house that's very much part of the story of Westminster Abbey and medieval Islip. As you come along here, the most important thing is we've actually got part of the wall that runs around the, the outskirts of the, of the manor. You see, we've got one edge there, that's the inside edge. And then on the outside edge here, so we've got the wall running parallel with the moat. And then on the outside again, we've got a lot of clay, which I think is part of the bank, which is stacked up against the wall. But the thing we've discovered now is, this is where we've put the trench over these anomalies here. Now we've extended the survey across the field. Look at these responses. Cool. <laughs> the main building is about 30 metres over there. Right, so this trench must be important if Jonathan's got his hands dirty. I'll dig for me supper. And you've done an extension. Uh, here, yes. Nobody tells me anything. <laughs> Could it be the chapel? Do you know, I think it can. And the reason I say that is because it's roughly where Stuart had mapped it. We've got a wall coming down here. It's cut into this see the shade of mucus there in the clay. Um, that would be the outside of it. That's the inside. The wall thickness is about right. If that's the north wall, this is the west one. Then we're looking for a door just the other side of the garden wall. So it could be this corner here, look. Northwest corner like that. Yeah. Right, sir? Who's queen of the dig? <laughs> <laughs> Me! <laughs> How did she do it? Well, she went below what we'd previously thought was undisturbed natural earth and got the wall below it. So today, this is what we think is the natural here, but we're going to get our archaeologists to go below that to see if we've got anything medieval too. The theory is we've discovered the northwest corner of the chapel in this garden and it's possibly the only bit that survives, as we've dug other trenches close by and found nothing. We can't open any more trenches, which is why we thought it was worth digging deeper here, just to see if we get any related finds. We decided to dig here because an old map had this field marked as the site of Ethelred's palace, where Edward the Confessor was born a thousand years ago. But we've now proved that the only important building remains in this field belong to the medieval manor. Yesterday, Geophys revealed this plot showing the extent of it, and today we're opening up trenches here, over what we think is the manor house itself, a building that must have been one of the biggest and grandest houses in the area. 
We know it must have been quite special because Isabella, Edward II's queen, stays here. Right. And so it's certainly fit for a, a royal residence. Um, but you see, that's interesting because we, we, I think we've been rather assuming that it's a, a fairly big sort of extensive complex, but, but, but it may not be from the implication of what well, you're Well, it saying. isn't really. I mean, in Doomsday, no? but look, if you look at Doomsday, it's quite small. It still seems most likely that the Saxon settlement was on top of the hill. But it could be that Islip was an even smaller place than Victor's drawn here. Phil? Yo! Nice bit of wall in it. Absolutely magnificent, isn't it? I mean, look at the size of it. And the beautiful thing of it is that we can actually tell that where Ian is, is outside the building. You can see that it's just dirt and soil. And where I'm standing is inside the building. So we would expect to find the other wall somewhere there, just inside the moat. Can you definitely say that that's medieval? Yes, I can, because all the pottery above it is medieval. There's nothing, there's nothing earlier or nothing later. It's, so it's sealed by medieval pottery. And more importantly, it's got a superb assemblage of roof tile. Yeah, they call these coxcombs with the sort of the jagged top. You know, it's, it's well, because they look like a coxcomb, I suppose. Paul's not easily impressed, but it's unusual to get so many finds of such quality. Personally, I'm intrigued by this bit of medieval glass. And that is a urinal. A urinal? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty exciting. Do you eh? mean like a potty, a long potty? <laughs> well, they were they're used for medicinal purposes. Um, in the medieval period, the urine was a key to recognising the symptoms of lots of diseases by the by the uh, the medical practitioners of the time. So you'd have these glass vessels for you'd put the urine in, hold it up to the light, and they'd make their pronouncements. Make sure you wash your hands before lunch. <laughs> <laughs> It's been so much easier digging in this field as opposed to up on the hill, where we can only put in small trenches. But no one can accuse us of not trying hard enough. Today, here in the Garden of Confessor's Gate, we've been digging deeper just to make sure we haven't missed any evidence relating to the medieval chapel we found next door. Well, yesterday I was giving your wife a really hard time because it seemed that your garden wasn't riddled with history in the way that you both hoped it would be. <laughs> but this morning we had a reassessment. We realised that actually we hadn't gone down as far in these trenches as we needed to go. So Matt spent virtually the whole day re-excavating these <laughs> trenches <laughs> and the news is I was right, there is no history <laughs> in your garden. There's nothing here at all. Nothing here at all, as you can see. Oh, look at that. It's a lovely great hole. Big, great big hole. Yes. But the good news is that it looks as though next door we've got the chapel. So great. the value yeah. of their house is going to rock it now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll solve them the name. As ever, back garden archaeology is a tricky business, and there's no predicting how it will turn out. Raksha, how's our chapel getting on? It's not really a chapel anymore. <laughs> You're kidding. No, it's a more humble building. It's a privy. You're joking. <laughs> no. So you've got a cesspit, in fact. Yes. Why? How do you know? <laughs> Found lots of a de degraded faeces, I'm afraid. There, there you go. Of it down there, really. And what's this thing here? It's a nice uh, kind of cauldron vessel cooking pot that we found. And you found bottom. it down the toilet? Yes. I can't imagine what it was doing down there. <laughs> what, what date is the cesspit? The cesspit is about 17th century. I can't believe it. Yesterday we were convinced we had a medieval chapel here. What happened? Raksha, as queen of the trenches, <laughs> how could you mistake a medieval chapel for a 17th century toilet. Well, it just shows it's an easy mistake to make. <laughs> <laughs> so we're in the right vicinity. Oh, yeah, there's probably, no doubt we're, we're, in the right, we're yeah. in the right patch for it, yeah. But just can't see it in any of the, the sections we've yeah. got. So it's not here. What a way to end a dig. I don't think I've ever felt so disappointed. What really hacks me off is that I'd assumed that at the end of the programme I would be standing here surrounded by one of those fantastic time team graphics of the chapel with those great walls shooting up in the air and that huge roof and those very interesting windows and instead I guess you'll have to make do with a drawing of some old bloke sitting on a 17th century loo. Join a thriving worldwide community of time team fans on Patreon. Our new target is to reach 15,000 worldwide supporters on Patreon by the end of 2025. This will enable us to continue expanding the Time Team world 
with more digs and greater access than ever before. A few years ago, some geophys was done over some crop marks in that field up there, and it produced some of the most tantalising results that we've seen for years. Not only that, but a metal detectorist has found a tiny bit of Bronze Age gold up there, and lots of pottery has come up, including this 5th century piece. But this is Cornwall, this is Turkish, and this tiny little bit, believe it or not, is African. So what on earth's going on here? Well, evidence has been found suggesting ancient mariners plied these waters thousands of years ago, bringing in from overseas exotic goods such as wine, silk and papyrus, and taking away local tin and copper. So is there the remotest chance that this is the shadow of an early trading site, the like of which we've never seen on Time Team before? As usual, we've got just three days to find out. The Atlantic coast in Cornwall is a spectacular and perilous place for a sailor, notoriously difficult to navigate and littered with treacherous rocks. But in amongst the dangers are sheltered havens like this, the mouth of the River Camel, a huge tidal inlet that joins the ancient fishing port of Padstow to the sea. And just a couple of hundred metres from the turbulent Atlantic is Lelizic, overlooking a beautiful sandy cove. This is so nice. It just reminds me of holidays as a kid, yeah. up on a headland, watching the boats coming in and out. And they've probably been coming in and out of an estuary like this for thousands of years, because this is an ideal place to live, just above the beach, south-facing, you know, settlement in this field here. Steve, spectacular geophys. Just amazing geophys, Tony, and um, we first became aware of this site as a result of uh, metal detecting activity and the range of, uh, of Bronze Age and, and Roman material. A few years later, I did a, a flight over the area looking for crop marks, and one of the sites that we recorded was this field, and we found a lot of circular features, ring ditches mm. at the top of the field. John, do you think these are houses? I'm sure some of them must be. I mean, look at the detail. You can actually see what appears to be a central hearth within that particular structure. I'm sure we're seeing lots of houses across the field. So, with the old geophys as our guide, we're going to start our investigation by opening two trenches, one in each of the fields that overlooks the beach. In the lower field nearest the cove, Matt and Raksha are putting a trench in over a large geophys anomaly, which doesn't much look like the traditional roundhouses in the other field. Could it be because the archaeology here, as Mick suspects, was linked to ancient trade? Whereas over in the upper field, Phil's investigating what could be an Iron Age roundhouse that wouldn't normally be associated with the types of finds previously discovered on this site. Finds that include pieces of Bronze Age axe, Roman coins, and of course, the intriguing exotic 5th and 6th century pottery from overseas. In fact, we could be looking at a thousand years of activity. But unfortunately, most of this material has been found lying about on the ground. And that means the archaeologists can't use it to date anything here. And the finds are tantalising. This is another one of these imported exotics. I don't recognise the specific type, although I do recognise that we've had identical material from Tintagel, which is the known type site here in Cornwall, which is only a few miles up the coast. So where do you think it's imported from? It's most likely have come from Turkey in the 5th or 6th centuries. Right, that's post-Roman. Post yes, yes. This is fantastic, our first link to the Mediterranean. And just as importantly, it looks as if this structure was used by local people from the early Roman period until 200 years after the Romans had left Britain. And that means, at the minute, there's little to link it to the prehistoric puzzles in the other field, where, in spite of the geophys, Phil's been struggling all day to find anything that looks remotely like an Iron Age roundhouse. Any sign of a hearth? 
No, not yet, not yet, but I, I mean... Granted, he's found ditches that could have been cut away for drainage, but he still hasn't got any fines. In fact, the most Iron Age roundhouse-ish type structure on site seems to be in Matt's much later Roman and Beyond trench. The geophysics showed this huge ring in this field here, and this is the ring here, it's this ditch. Oh, so that is actually that. Yeah, it goes all the way around like that. So now I'm walking into the house and you can see that the soil is kind of going this dark grey colour, especially around here. That's because there's so much charcoal in here. And we found some burnt animal bone up there as well, so I mean, there's just their rubbish all over the floor, really. Is this the wall on the other side? Ah, now, according to the geophysics, the ditch there, the wall ditch, should go round behind you and should be at the other end of the trench there. So this should be about the centre of the house. So is this the hearth that's producing all the charcoal and, and burnt material? Yeah, it looks like it. Right. You've got fines in the fines tray? Yep, yeah, we've some great stuff out of here. And so there's another bit down there? Yep, yeah, yeah, there's another bit in situ down there, you can see. That's a bit of amphora. So these are these big wine or oil storage jars. And this is coming from the East Mediterranean, then? Yep, yeah, that's post-Roman as well. That's 5th wow. or 6th century. <laughs> So if this isn't my outside wall, where is the other outside wall? Well, according to the geophysics, it should be right about the other end of the trench there. Right here somewhere? Yep. Rakshar, can you stand up for a sec? And the other wall is where Rakshar is. Mm -hmm. If that's right, it's a heck of a big building, Mick. It's a huge building, especially if it's producing material like this, this post-Roman stuff. That's really exciting. Why would it be so significant if it was that sort of date? Because we don't get structures that are sort of post-Roman very often, particularly with the finds associated with them. And the star find in Matt's trench yesterday was this small piece of Turkish pottery that had somehow travelled hundreds, even thousands of miles from the Mediterranean ports to Cornwall in the 5th or 6th century. And it's this evidence, along with the pieces of African pot that have already been found, that lead archaeologists to believe our cove could once have been visited by ships from all over southern Europe. The problem for me is it seems an odd place to put a harbour. Talk to local fishermen who've plied these waters all their lives and they'll tell you that this quiet stretch of the Cornish coast is deceptively dangerous. You've got a big swell coming in that turns the boats over. They get there and they get smashed up. Is there a way through that local people will know or do you just have to leave it alone? Only on the high water. Yeah. The local boats will go in any time after about three hours, three hours or four hours flood. And then they can go in and they take their time, they come across the bar and go across then. It would have been incredibly difficult a couple of thousand years ago, wouldn't it, if you were coming in from Turkey or Africa somewhere and you, you found this? That was where the sailing ships went aground, you see, because they would come up channel with like a, a southwest breeze, gale of wind, we'll say. And as soon as they got in here, the southwest wind had come in out the river at them. And that's how they all found it on the shore over there. They wouldn't know what it is, would they? Got some lovely bits of uh, pottery coming up now, Carl. Over in the Iron Age settlement, it looks like Phil's made the breakthrough he's been hoping for. The confusing strips of rock are beginning to reveal a recognisable shape, and there's at last some datable pottery from the trench. Oh, well, that's fantastic. This is the first distinctive Iron Age um, shirt I've seen on the site. I can tell that because it's very upright in nature, whereas the Roman ones are much more folded over. Probably sort of late third, early second century BC. So there's absolutely no doubt this could not be into the Roman period. No, this is definitely Iron Age from the upright nature of the rim. I mean, the thing that strikes me is that that shirt and the others with it are so big and in such good condition they can only have come from this building. Absolutely. It would seem Phil's now confident enough to say that there is a building in his trench and it's roughly the same date as Francis's roundhouse. The trouble for me with a trench like this is all I can see are these great stripes of natural rock with this gritty stuff in between. And then down here, a great tumble of stuff. It's hard to imagine that anyone ever actually lived here. It just all looks so bleak until you come up with something like this, which Phil just found. And it's so crisp. It, it could have been made 25, 
50 years ago. But, Phil, this is actually Iron Age, isn't it? Oh, most certainly it is. I mean, we found it with all the Iron Age pottery. It, it's a spindle whorl. It's a natural stone with a perfect hole just drilled right the way through it. And they would have used it to, to, to spin their yarn. And, and although we haven't got the piece of stick, and although we haven't got the yarn, we haven't got the woolen garments, we know they existed simply because we got this. But as one archaeological door opens, another slams in your face. We've gained an extra roundhouse in Phil's trench, but Francis seems to have lost the settlement ditch he'd told me was right here. Uh, yes, well, that's what we thought this morning. Um, but I now think that it's the ditch that goes all the way round a house. But you said that ran round the whole Iron Age roundhouse, that ditch, this one, ran round the whole settlement. Yes, um, the, the problem has been that the ditch that went all the way round the house um, isn't there. So you weren't quite 100% right? No, I was 100% wrong. So what is this? Well, look, here's your outer ditch for your house, yeah. OK? Then the wall would have been about here. Ah. And then here is the centre of the house. And right in the centre, look, we have a fantastically good hearth. That is gorgeous. Isn't, isn't it? it? Yeah. Lined with stone and then with all this burning here. And it's uh, cut into a floor. And so this is, this is certainly the level where people actually walk, so that's very important. And um, it's in a sort of oval feature. It, that might just be the filling of a grave with a crouch burial in it, because on Iron Age sites, sometimes they placed hearths on top of ancestral graves. That would be nice, wouldn't it? It would be lovely. <laughs> Phil! Could I go? A bit of that one, I can't. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. This is definitely a native Roman ware, um, certainly late second, early third century. That, that's fantastic. We've definitely got the Roman now. It's still not a furnace, oh, though. No, Get no, on no, with no. it. Dating, that's what we want. Cracking, isn't it, eh? Over in Matt's trench, we still can't figure out what this not very round house is doing here. Looks like there could be two pieces, actually. Mm. They do. Now, that's the same 5th and 6th century stuff that we had from this trench before. This is really high-status stuff. I mean, it, it would have had wine or olive oil in it. But, I mean, you just don't find this sort of thing on most British sites. And, uh, I mean, to find one really fresh shirt, it hasn't been lying around for long. Mm. So that's got straight into the ground. And there's another one there's right another underneath one it. it. <laughs> I let's, mean, get, let's get that bit out as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're from the same pot. What's the betting I can get them to join? I'll get you a drink if you can sort it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there they there go. go. Uh, oh, you a pint. <laughs> you owe me a pint, Matt. <laughs> yes, beautiful. I'm glad we've got an experienced archaeologist on this dig. This may be the least convincing pot reconstruction ever, but it's yet more evidence of trade in this case oil or wine, coming along this coast in the 5th or 6th century. And if they brought a ship laden with cargo all the way from the heart of the Byzantine Empire, it would strongly indicate that the merchants knew their journey would be worth it. So we can only suppose they must have been exchanging their goods for the high-value tin and copper that Cornwall was famous for. But all our dating evidence shows this lucrative trade stopped suddenly in the 6th century. Back in the upper field, a jubilant Francis has found his target. I've no idea how he can tell from this rather manky trench, but I know he's going to show me. Well, in some respects, I think this is part of a key to the site. Um, that little depression where Ian's working is, in fact, a ditch. And there's another ditch here, and those two ditches mark the edge of a droveway. You say a droveway, what are they driving along it? Sheep and cattle, probably. Now, if you look at where this droveway is going to and from, at that end, over there, it starts just this side of those cottages. Yeah. OK? Now, all the way around this bay, you've got open grazing on the edges of the cliffs and the rocks. So you've probably had thousands of sheep and cattle out there, and then they were taken in, probably in the autumn, along this droveway, and then beyond them, 
over there, you've got a large animal field or stock enclosure. Now, if you look at the edge of the settlement, it's going round like that and then like that in two distinct arcs. And I think that arc is defining the edge of that stockyard, making it a usable shape. And similarly, this is defining the edge of an arable field. And those two arable fields are precisely the same size, which is what you need if you're a farmer. What about the date? Uh, now, that's a tricky one. We know that this droveway is in a terrace that was ground down by animals' hooves over hundreds of years, probably. So I wouldn't be at all surprised if this droveway didn't begin in the Bronze Age, then go on into the Iron Age when it was formalised by the ditches. So, for all we know, there could be a thousand years of settlement on this hillside. Thank you, Francis. That's why this cluster of houses was such a peculiar shape. We simply haven't been able to find any material evidence that links roundhouses to the port complex next door. But with such a dense collection of sturdy large houses, I can't help but think this village must have benefited from the prosperity a successful port brings. We found coins, samianware, slag and food waste. But we've been missing a crucial piece of evidence until now. These, Tony, are African red slipware sherds, which down here in Cornwall generally mean 5th and 6th century deposits. So that's post-Roman? Indeed, yes. And where were they found? Well, this is the important thing. Those shirts were found in there. In other words, they are well stratified. All the other shirts that we've had of that type of pottery have been in the colluvium, the hill wash, so they're totally unstratified. The, the stratification for them is good. Now that's digging speak for undisturbed archaeology. And it proves that these Byzantine finds in Phil's Trench are contemporary with Matt's finds next door. We now believe the whole site probably evolved over many hundreds of years from a Bronze Age farming community into one of the small but bustling late Iron Age trading centres scattered around the Cornish coast, meeting the demands for local commodities as the Roman Empire expanded. After the Romans disappeared in the 5th century, merchants would have continued to call in occasionally with their exotic goods until the Byzantine Empire faded several hundred years later. It's lovely, isn't it? The perfect Cornish seaside picture with fields rolling down to the sea. It's hard to imagine just how busy it must have been in the ancient past with a thriving settlement trading with ships sailing in from the continent and beyond. And as they came in below that cliff just there, they would have brought with them fancy goods like oil and wine and new ideas too, perfectly symbolised by this find that's come up in the last hour or so. It's a stylus, possibly the earliest evidence of writing ever found in Cornwall, dating from around 200 AD. Maybe it was used to record all those imports. If you'd like to see more episodes like this, you can make it happen. Our new target is to reach 15,000 worldwide supporters on Patreon by the end of 2025. This will enable us to continue expanding the Time Team world. Enjoy front row seats for the greatest show on earth and under it. The building at the heart of this story lies here in the city centre and it revolutionised British society. Built in 1780, on this spot was the first cotton mill in Manchester. Today it's buried under this car park and we've got just three days to locate and retrieve one of the most important historic sites in Britain. Not that you'd know it today. Francis, if there was a mill here, they've managed to wipe out every single piece of evidence of it. Well, not actually, Tony. Behind you there, you can see you've got cobbles. Now, I think that was the surface of the yard that went outside the mill. That's certainly early 19th century cobbles. So presumably then, Mike, the front of the mill was run along those cobbles. Yes, Francis, we've actually got a number of maps. This is one from 1831, and it shows the mill as a rectangular building with a reservoir below it, and then the cobbles running in between. If we know that, 
then why are we bothering to dig the site? Because although this is a factory that's been used for 150 years, Tony, we don't know how the mill was laid out, we don't know how it develops. But digging one rectangular building isn't going to take three days, is it? Not one building, it's been rebuilt a number of times. Oh. Burnt down in the 1850s, for instance. Arkwright created two cutting-edge systems for the mill. The first was a steam engine to power the mill directly, something no one else had yet achieved. The second was an innovative water system that used a steam engine together with a water wheel. The site hasn't been developed since the Blitz of 1940, when a mill rebuilt in the Victorian era was destroyed by the Luftwaffe. Kerry, this is it. This is the wall of the mill house. We've got the yard out there, and here's the wall, and then inside the mill. Let's see a bit more of this wall here. If Phil has hit the wall of Arkwright's 1780s mill, he's uncovered a building at the root of massive change in Manchester, a building that helped transform a village into a metropolis. As day one nears an end, we're still not sure if Phil's walls are Arkwright, but Mike's confident of the date of the wall in Trench 3. Well, we stopped digging and starting the recording. What's happened here? Well, what we've got here, Tony, is we've got the end of the mill. Uh, we've got the cobbles here, yeah. and then we've got a, a line of bricks. They're a bit bashed about by a couple of holes which have been bashed through in the mid-20th century, but either side, we have brick walling. You see, we've got two rows of bricks here, and then a row of bricks and some stone sets over here, and we think that's the doorway into the mill. You say it's the doorway into the mill, but earlier ah. you said to me there were lots of mills at different times. There are lots of mills. Now, we're pretty certain this is Arkwright's 1781 to 82 mill. Why? This is a brick from 1854. It's very sharp, it's wire cut, and it's quite chunky, very nicely made. However, that is a brick from this wall. Much, much more irregular. It's made in a wooden mould. It's a slightly smaller si a size and it's far more irregular. And this was made in Manchester between 1780 and 1820. This is the brick from Arkwright's first mill. For you, this dig isn't just about some old bits of machinery, is it? No, it's about the really terrible lives of the people that worked in the mill and lived right in its shadow. In fact, over there, there were some buildings that we think had cellar dwellings underneath them where the people may have actually lived. We're going to look at those tomorrow. Should be some good finds there, shouldn't there? I hope there? so. But in addition to that, we've started work on this trench here, which is going to be huge. And already we've come up with this really interesting arch here. So tomorrow, we're not only going to try and get into the hearts and minds of the people who lived here, but into the heart of the factory that dominated their lives. Bridge has made great progress on her Angel Street house, revealing nearly a complete cellar dwelling in just a couple of hours. Victorian reports from Frederick Engels and others describe the hardships of living and working in the mills of the area. One of our team, Stuart, has got a personal insight into what mill life would have been like. His mother worked in a mill near Leeds. I remember how little money we had in those early days, and uh, I can remember hiding from the rent man when we, the, cause we were, when we were a bit short on a Monday night. We used to we used to have to keep quiet, and the lights were turned down because the rent man was expecting things like that. It's weird because whenever we talk about mill life. It seems like it was another era. It's amazing to me that you, who a relatively young bloke... Thank you. <laughs> ..still remember it. Well, I do. I grew, I grew up with it. My, my mother was a weaver, worked in, in the weaving sheds all her life. She was incredibly physically strong. She worked eight looms at once, but had to keep them all going the whole time, so incredibly hard physical work. You know, one of the historians told me, and I thought this was so extraordinary, that all those northern comedians who used to speak like that with all those <laughs> gestures. They actually did it, not as an affectation, but because virtually all of them worked in the mills and it was so noisy there yeah. that they continually had to do all that elaborate communication, otherwise no one would ever understand what they were saying. Yeah, and I can actually remember you know, the, the looms turning, the noise, the workforce, the people. And one thing I remember about the lost my mum's friends, um, the weavers, is that they, they'd lost fingers because uh, when the shuttle was going backwards and forwards, you had to catch it 
and turn it round. And if you didn't get it right, it took your finger off. And I remember a lot of my mum's friends all, all sort of missing the odd end of their finger or a finger missing and things like that. So injury and deafness and hard work were all part of a, a weaver's life. Beginning of day three, and guess what? It's raining in Manchester. Mind you, it would have been pretty wet here 220 odd years ago when Richard Arkwright built his mill, because we're pretty sure the whole thing was powered by water and steam. Not that we've found that much of the factory, because every time we've got anywhere near it, it miraculously seems to disappear through our fingers, isn't it? So, are you really confident? that we actually do have the water wheel here. Yes, yes, yes. absolutely. Oh, hooray, hooray, hooray. And yet you've been found wanting so many times over the last 48 hours. Why are you so sure? Well, all the maps tell us the water wheel was in this position here where we stood. We've seen it on the radar plan, but if you're not convinced, look at this vertical section. There's the top of the ground. That red line marks that road surface. Below that road surface is this clear response. That has to be the wheel pit. And does it work for you in terms of the logic of the architecture? It does, Tony, because we're in the middle of the mill, and that, in an off-right mill, is where the water wheel will be. So why is it so significant that we find this wheel? Well, it will tie everything down. Yeah, I mean, if you know the position of the water wheel, it transfers the energy via a shaft into the mill. And once you know the position of that, you can work out where all the looms are, how many there would be. The whole layout is dependent on finding that. Back on site, the hunt for the wheel pit isn't going quite as planned. Francis, can I remind you of an exchange earlier on today? Tony, are you confident <laughs> that there is a water wheel in this trench? You four? Yes, 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 yes. Hello, water wheel, where are you? It's not there. Uh, it's turned out to be a little bit more complicated than that, Tony. <laughs> is it? Uh, yeah. In fact, it's, it, it's all happening as we speak. <laughs> Phil down there has got something, and I don't know what it is. And he won't tell us. Francis! Yeah? Got it! Really? Yes! Yards away, Phil's now uncovered the thing that ran under the wall. <laughs> Come and have a look. Oh, hey. <laughs> what do you think of that, then? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't expecting that, Phil. <laughs> It's a 20th century drain. Well, I'm completely gobsmacked. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon we might actually finally have this well pit, you know. That is deep. <laughs> that is deep. How Just, deep are you now? Well, I did dangle a tape over there and it was 12 foot, so it's supposed to be 15 foot, so I'm, I'm my money's on three more foot. And that's eight that, feet wide? That's eight foot wide, yeah. just bang on the money for that one. And we didn't see it. <laughs> all the walls down there, all four of them, appear to be lined in this stuff, and, and, and it's all the way round. Well, that looks like that pitch or bitumen, but that's the ceiling. That's right, then presumably that hole was designed to take water, that's going to protect the brickwork. Yeah, it would have to be watertight, so that could mean that's a well. What if this is the very first steam engine he installed, the 1781 one? which was meant to be running the machinery. That would have to be in the middle of the mill, like a water wheel, to run the machinery. It failed, but instead of building a new engine, they adapted it as a pumping engine. That, that would mean that we found our 1781 engine and, it, and, and it, under our very noses, it was here all the time. <laughs> OK. OK, thanks, Mike. <laughs> it's deep. It's massive, isn't it? <laughs> all right, so if the wheel was in there, what about the steam? Come over here. We now think this is the site of Arkwright's 1781 steam engine he tried to use to power textile machinery. But if that was his very first engine, that was the one that didn't work properly. It so, was. So why is it still here? Well, it was positioned in the middle of the mill so it could run the line shafting to power the textile machinery that way. Yeah. It didn't work. So what it looks like they've done is they've reused it for pumping water from the lower reservoir through the well there and out onto a spillway into channels running that way. Somebody has tried to apply steam to textile machinery. So this isn't just archaeology, this is history. This is where the modern world begins. Join Time Team on Patreon to access exclusive 3D models, masterclasses and behind-the-scenes insights. <laughs>